Okay, uh, let's start our second talk, please. Um, uh, so Benoit Vichado uh, uh, uni uh, from University of York will present the talk, the Godin model from 3D mixed BF theory. Please, Benoit. Okay, so thank you very much. So let me start by thanking the organizers for the opportunity to give this talk. Um, so what I want to tell you about is um, the gauge theoretic approach to integrable systems, which was proposed by Costello and, and further developed by Costello, Witt, and Yamazaki, uh, which is based on 4D Chun Simons theory. So I'll actually be talking about a slight variation of this story, which is based instead on 3D uh, mixed BF theory. And the purpose is that uh, this theory can be used to describe finite dimensional integrable systems. So it's, it's a very useful toy model for understanding the gauge theoretic or origin of integrability, I think. So uh, the talk will be based on this paper with my student, uh, Gen Jennifer Winston. So I'll refer you to it for details on what I'll talk about. Okay, so let me start with a very brief summary um, by reminding you that 4D Chern Simons theory has, um, is sort of like a mother theory for integrable systems in the sense that it can be used to describe two different types of integrable systems. In particular, if you introduce line defects in the 4D Chern Simons theory, you can describe in this way integrable lattice models, which are, um, whose integrable structure is underpinned by this um, RLL um, constant structure. Or more precisely, because I'll be focusing in this talk on classical systems, I should talk about the Sklianin bracket, which is a, a quadratic bracket in the Lax matrix for the Lax matrix with itself. And another thing you can do from 4D Chern Simons is introduce surface defects to describe instead two dimensional integrable field theories, uh, where the integrable structure in this case is underlined by this um, linear Poisson bracket in the Lax matrix, but with these delta functions uh, because we're dealing with a field theory. Okay. So what I want to tell you in this talk is how a similar story works uh, for finite dimensional integrable systems with linear brackets in, for the Lax matrix, where the correct theory to start from is 3D BF theory, okay? So I want to essentially explain in detail how this construction works to go from 3D BF theory by introducing line defects and gauge fixing to obtain um, finite dimensional integrable systems, specifically ones which arise as realizations of Godard models, okay? So uh, to start with, let me just remind you in one slide, um, for, the point, for the purpose of this talk, what, uh, what we know about 4D Chern Simons theory and how it relates to two-dimensional integrable field theories. So if you start with 4D Chern Simons theory on the cylinder um, times the CP1, which will play the role of the spectral plane, uh, what you do is you start by introducing surface defects, which are along the cylinder and at fixed points in CP1. And then you impose boundary conditions on your gauge field at these surface defects. And after gauge fixing, you find that the um, gauge field of the 4D Chern Simons theory um, becomes the lax matrix of the integrable field theory in two dimensions. So you should think of the uh, field theory as living on the surface defects, which are essentially copies of R cross S1. So you end up with a theory on the cylinder. So there's an alternative approach to producing a large family of integrable field theories on the cylinder, which is to use affine and Godin models. So this is more rooted in the Hamiltonian formalism. And the idea here is you start with a Godin model based on an affine Katzmudi algebra. So we heard about Godin model, uh, God, the Godin model yesterday in um, Ilya Burick's talk. This kind of mo Godin model will be one associated to an affine algebra rather than a finite dimensional Lie algebra. And the point is that to get a specific integrable model, what you do is you choose a realization of your affine Katzmudi algebra at each site of the Godin model. Okay, so the, in the talk yesterday, the realizations were uh, of principal series type, uh, and it was for, for Lie, algebra B, Lie algebra of type BOC, if I remember. And so in this case, you'd have an affine Katzmudi algebra, which you realize um, um, using your favorite representation, and you obtain some integrable system. So of course, these two approaches are very intimately related. And in fact, uh, you can go from one to the other. You, you can start from the action for chern simons theory, perform a Legendre transform to, get the, uh, to go to the Hamiltonian formalism, and after suitable gauge fixing, you end up with a Godin model. Okay. So the motivation for this work was really to try and understand what is the analog of this picture if I replace the affine Godin model by a finite Godin model, which is supposed to describe not integrable field theories, but integrable systems of finite dimension. Okay. So this is um, sort of the, the question, what's the finite dimensional analog? And the answer is this picture. So um, I'm saying finite dimensional analog because as I said, the, the Godin model here is based on a finite dimensional Lie algebra now. 
And the um, resulting integrable system is a finite dimensional integrable system. Okay, so I'll explain how 3D mixed BF theory on R cross CP1 can be used in the same way as 4D Chan Simons to construct such Godin models. Okay, so the plan of my talk is, is this picture. So I'm going to start with uh, reminding you or telling you what the Godin model is. I'll, I'll focus on the case of a finite dimensional Lie algebra. Um, and then I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example of a realization to produce a concrete integrable system out of it. So you should think of the Godin model as sort of, sort of a universal integrable model uh, based on a Lie algebra, but then if you realize the Lie algebra in a certain way, you get specific integrable models. And then I'll explain how to get the same model down here from 3D mixed BF theory. Okay, so by, I'll, it's broken down into various steps, so I'll explain these steps after introducing 3D mixed BF theory. Okay, so let me start by uh, recalling what the Godin model is. So the data is, you need a, is a finite dimensional semi-simple Lie algebra over the complex numbers. Uh, fix some um, non-degenerate symmetric bilinear form on the Lie algebra. And then you pick um, some dual bases with respect to this bilinear form. This is just convenient for describing the Lax matrix. Uh, and then uh, you fix a set of mark points on, on the complex plane. So Z1 up to Zn are complex numbers. And uh, the dynamical variables of the Godin model are essentially just copies of the Lie algebra as attached to these marked points. So essentially, you take your basis elements IA and you, you introduce an extra label 1 up to n, which labels the marked point. And uh, these basis elements are attached to that particular marked point. So these are sort of the abstract Lie algebra generators, which you should think of as dynamical variables in the Godin model. So the, um, so the algebra of observables of the Godin model is symmetric uh, polynomials in this, um, in this Lie algebra G direct sum n. So it's convenient to package all these dynamical variables into a matrix. Uh, namely, you just take the tensor product with the dual um, basis element. So in GLN, you should think of this as a matrix. Uh, so you can also do this for reductive Lie algebras. In this case, you'd have G in GLN, you have a, a matrix here. And these are just uh, the ge abstract generators of the Lie algebras at each site. And they're packaged together in the form of a matrix. Okay? So this is sort of like a G-valued dynamical variable for the Godin model. Okay. So um, the Lie bracket for uh, these dynamical variables is just the Lie bracket for G, but uh, you have n copies of it which mutually commute. So you take the Lie bracket of dynamical variables at site i and site j. If i is not equal to j, you get 0. Otherwise, you just get the Lie bracket at this site. And you can conveniently uh, package these in terms of the g-valued um, dynamical variable j in the form of this constant Kirillov bracket. So here I've written the bracket as a Poisson bracket because I'm thinking of classical systems. So um, essentially, on, on linear generators like these ones, on linear observables like these ones, the Lie bracket defines the Poisson bracket. And then you extend it by Leibniz to all other observables. Okay, so this is really a Poisson bracket on the phase space. And it's given in this form. So um, this will come up later, so it's useful to remember. Here, uh, C12 is just the tensor product of the dual basis elements of the Lie algebra. And I'm always implicitly summing over repeated indices. So the Lax matrix of the Godin model is given by this um, formal combination of these uh, g-valued um, variables. So this bracket can, again, be conveniently rewritten in this, in this nice form which is just the lax uh, bracket for um, the Godin model. So it's the one I mentioned in the first slide, where now the R matrix is this explicit um, R matrix. Okay. So the advantage of writing the, um, the Poisson brackets of the phase space in this form is that it um, immediately produces a very large family of integrals of motion, uh, which Poisson commutes. So in particular, if you choose adjoint invariant polynomials, P and Q, by which I mean that they're invariant under the adjoint action, like this, then if you evaluate uh, the Lax matrix, uh, you, you evaluate these polynomials on the Lax matrix at different parameters z and w, these Poisson commute essentially by, um, by virtue of the fact that the Poisson bracket here is a Lie bracket. Okay. So then uh, to define the Hamiltonian of the Godin model, you just pick a w and you pick a polynomial, which is invariant, and you define the Hamiltonian as this um, polynomial p applied to the Lax matrix at w. So this just fixes a choice of Hamiltonian. And then by this construction, you get a, a large family of um, integrals of motion which mutually commute with each other. Okay. And I should say here, P is applied to the auxiliary space, to so the matrix part. And so what you get out of it is a polynomial in the dynamical variables of the Godin model. Okay. So having the, good, the Hamiltonian, 
we can now define um, time evolution in this model. So it's just Poisson bracket with the Hamiltonian. For any of observable, the time evolution is given in this way. And in particular, the Lax matrix evolves according to the Lax equation, where M here is just this particular um, matrix, which is uh, um, related to the Lax matrix L at W. Okay, so just P prime here is just the derivative of the polynomial, um, which at a point X in the Lie algebra is just a linear map. But by duality of G star with G, you can think of this as a Lie algebra element. So P prime of X is a Lie algebra element. And so this is really just uh, an ele it's, a, it's a matrix with entries in the symmetric algebra G direct sum N. Okay, so concretely think of GLN. Uh, an example of an invariant polynomial is the trace of X to the N, then this is the formula for M in this case, okay? So uh, now I want to tell you about a, a specific realization, which is actually a very uh, broad class of realizations, which I'll then be able to reproduce from the 3D BF theory. So uh, to define them, I need um, to fix some Lie algebra elements u1 up to un. And I'm going to look at the orbits under the adjoint action of these elements in the Lie algebra g. So these are called uh, OUI, the adjoint orbits. And it turns out that these have a very canonical Poisson structure or symplectic structure. So these are symplectic manifolds. And the product of these is also a symplectic manifold with this concrete Poisson bracket. So u hat is my notation for points on the orbit. So these are just elements you can obtain by conjugation with some g, uh, with some element of g uh, acting on the, um, the starting point ui. Okay, so you recognize that this is the same as the Poisson brackets um, of the abstract generators of the Godard model. So this tells you that you can uh, realize the Godard model concretely by sending the abstract generators ji, these are the g-valued generators, to these g-valued um, points in the coadjoint orbit or in the adjoint orbit, okay? So concretely these uh, Lie algebra generators here, they're sent to the coordinates of this point on the phase space in the basis IA. Okay, so these are functions on the, on the product of quadjoint orbits, and they're the images of the linear elements in this symmetric algebra. Okay. So just to summarize, uh, this is the, 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 basically the three things I want to reproduce from 3DBF theory. So the Lax matrix in this realization is given by this rational function with coefficients which are these um, uh, adjoint orbits of fixed elements ui. Uh, and then this, by construction, satisfies this Lax algebra. And the evolution is given by this um, Lax equation where time evolution is with respect to the Hamiltonian I talked about before, which is P of L of W, okay? So if you can remember these three equations, I'll, they'll come up again and I'll reproduce them in, from the 3D BF3. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What is the difference between this and the previous Lax matrix? So this is um, just realized concretely in terms of um, group valued fields, which parameterize, if you like, the adjoint orbit. So you can think of this H like as your dynamical variable of some, of some physical system. Sorry? The algebra generators are the function on the group. Uh, so I don't think I understand the question. But so uh, an example of a function on, on this product of adjoint orbits is just given by the coordinates of um, these points on the adjoint orbit. So these are the u hat ai. These are functions on the, on the coadjoint orbit. And they happen to satisfy the same relations as these abstract generators. So these are really functions on the adjoint orbits. Right? So you can think of this now as, as physical, classical physical system where you are describing your, um, your phase space by functions on, on the cotangent bundle of some, yes, on some symplectic manifold, okay? So this is really functions on a symplectic manifold, but it's a, a, re, a concrete realization of the abstract generators of the Godard model, which were just Lie algebra elements, right? So you went from abstract elements to functions on some symplectic manifold, okay? Yeah, just some right. arbitrary fixed Lie algebra elements. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. So now let me turn to the 3D mixed BF theory. Uh, so first, let me introduce this theory. So um, it's defined by similar data to the Godard model. So I fix some uh, semi-simple complex Lie group with Lie algebra G, which will be the same as as before, and I also have the same bilinear form as before. 
And the fields of the model are just given by these two fields, A and B. So A is just a generic one form. Uh, it's a G-valued one form, which is smooth on R cross CP1. So it has, in particular, legs in the three directions, dt, dz, and dz bar, where t is the coordinate on r, and z, z bar are the coordinates on cp1. Uh, on the other hand, b is just a one zero form, one zero relative to the complex structure on cp1. So what that means is that it just has a leg in the direction dz. Okay? Uh, but importantly, you should remember that these are just smooth functions for the moment of all coordinates, just smooth functions valued in the Lie algebra. Um, uh, Smooth functions on this on this space. Okay, so the action is just given as follows. So it's called BF theory because the action is BF, uh, and in other words, you just take the curvature of the of the one form A, defined in this way, and you just pair it with the one zero form B. Okay, so um, by looking at the action, there's an immediate gauge invariance uh, coming from the fact that B is has a only a dz component. So in other words, if A has any dz component, it will just drop out from the action. Okay? So I should say here this is the uh, inner product in the Lie algebra, and it's the wedge product of the forms, okay? this notation. So I'm taking the inner product on the Lie algebra part and the wedge product of forms. So uh, because you're wedging with B, which has only a dz component, any component along dz for the field A drops out. So you can just fix this gauge invariance by just demanding that A has no z component. Okay. So in particular, now we're left with a, a, an A field which has these two components, dt and dz bar, and B still has its one component, dz. Okay. So a more interesting gauge invariance is the following, um, which is a um, more recognizable gauge invariance, where A transforms as a connection. It's really a partial connection because you, don't, um, you ignore the AZ component. So G can still depend on, on Z. But you just ignore the Z, the, any, Z depend, any, any Z component which is produced because we can always gauge it away as before. So we just set AZ to zero. So uh, in particular, because A transforms as a connection, the curvature transforms as by, gauge, by conjugation. And so if we let B transform by conjugation, then the action is invariant, okay? because we have an adjoint invariant bilinear form. Okay. So the equations of motion are easy to derive. So for B, it's, it's trivial. You just get the curvature of, of A. So that's this equation for B. And for A, you find these equations of motion. So the first striking thing you notice is that this looks a lot like the Lax equation for a finite dimensional integrable system. If you identify BZ with the Lax matrix and M with, the, uh, with minus AT. Okay? So it looks like it, but it's far from it for the moment because um, there's a big problem, which is that uh, if you call this L and this M, then L and M actually depend smoothly on Z and Z bar, whereas you want them to be meromorphic. Okay. So what we should remember, however, is that we're dealing with a gauge theory. And so the hope is that there's some gauge in which we can actually choose L and M to be meromorphic. Okay. So uh, that's the next part. So let's try to gauge fix to make the, the lax matrices um, or the lax pair meromorphic. So you notice, coming back to these equations, that there's these AZ bar dependent on the right-hand side. So if we can choose a gauge where AZ bar is zero, then we'll get that AT is uh, holomorphic and BZ is also holomorphic, because the right-hand side here will be zero. So this is the idea. We use this gauge-fixing condition, which is really the same as the gauge-fixing condition used in 4D chan simons theory to produce integrable systems. So you go to this gauge, and then you find that the equations of motion that I didn't um, focus on before, they just tell you that AT and BZ, the, these components, are just uh, holomorphic. Okay? Uh, so there's still a problem, which is that uh, we wanted lax matrices which are meromorphic in Z, not just holomorphic. So they have no poles in Z. There's no possibility of having poles so far. And the other issue is that uh, L and M, as, as derived here, they're completely unrelated. So we want M to be built out of L, remember, as uh, some polynomial of the lax matrix L. But here, L and M are completely unrelated. So these two issues we can fix by introducing some line defects, suitably chosen line defects, in the 3D BF theory. OK, so, so let me describe these line defects. So essentially, you just modify the action by introducing some terms which are localized on some lines in this R cross CP1 three-dimensional space. So I've drawn here. Um, picture of CP1 just as a plane, and then R as this transverse direction. 
So what you want to do is um, modify the action by adding two types of defects. So we call these type A and type B because they depend just on A and B fields. And so these are localized on these lines which are at the mark points ZI of the Godin model for the type A defects and at some new point W for the type B defect. Okay. So more precisely, these are ex exactly the same data as we had in the Godin model because they will turn out to be um, producing exactly the Godin model. So A, sorry, these UJs are precisely uh, fixed elements of the Lie algebra G as we had before for describing the co-adjoint orbits. This H is just a group valued field on R. It depends only on R because it's living on these defects. Um, and then P is for the moment just some polynomial but it will have to be invariant in a second, okay? So if we think about gauge invariance, we can, um, this, this term is obviously still gauge invariant, but we can promote these two terms to ga gauge invariant um, defects. Uh, for, the f for the second term, we just have to ensure that the polynomial P is adjoint invariant, so that the gauge transformation uh, of the B field is canceled. So just choose P to be an adjoint invariant polynomial, and then this second term is gauge invariant. And for the first term, you want to just compensate the gauge transformation of the field A by suitably transforming H uh, to cancel off the, the gauge transformation. So uh, you just choose H to transform by left multiplication by the group value field G evaluated at the defect. Okay, so this will make this combination gauge invariant and therefore this, sec this second term here gauge invariant. So we have now a gauge, gauge theory again. Uh, we can look at the equations of motion and they're now modified precisely by these two terms we added. So um, the first equation of motion for B is modified by this delta derivative, sorry, this um, Dirac delta function term, uh, which is localized at Z equals W because it comes from this term. Okay, so you can write this as the integral over C, uh, R cross CP1 times a delta function. And so that's where this delta function comes from. Uh, it's, it's in the equations of motion is purely localized at Z equals W. And similarly, th this equation of motion here is, is modified by these delta functions at ZJ. Okay. So uh, we can now go to the same gauge uh, as before. So again, all these terms with AZ bar disappear, but now we're left with some non-trivial terms on the right-hand side of these two equations. Uh, so rather than having L and M now being holomorphic, they're now meromorphic using this um, property of the delta function. So DZ bar of one of Z minus W is proportional to the delta function. So this gives you that the Lax matrix is now meromorphic with poles at these ZJs. Um, and the residues are given by the coefficients of these delta functions. And similarly, um, the first equation tells you that A, which is minus M, is um, essentially a rational function with pole at Z equals W and coefficient this expression. So that's the expression for M, which we recognize as um, the lax pair of the Godin model. So on the equations of motion, we've already reproduced the, equa the equations of motion of the Godin model uh, just by introducing these, these defects in 3D BF3. Okay. Any question? So to really complete the story, we have to now perform a Hamiltonian analysis of 3D BF theory and uh, show that the Poisson brackets of the gauge field, yeah? Yeah. Exactly. So, so AZ is gone. AZ bar I've set to zero as well. So all that's left is AT and BZ, and these are the lax pair of the Godin model. Yeah. Okay. So now let me essentially go back to the start and just start from the action and derive, um, perform the Hamiltonian analysis of this theory. And the hope is to show that um, B, which is the lax matrix, satisfies the correct Poisson bracket. Okay. The lax algebra. So we introduce conjugate momenta for all the fields. Um, the conjugate momentum for the group valued element G, uh, HI at each site is a Lie algebra element. So you can think of this as sort of parameterizing a cotangent bundle for the, for the group element G. So this XI is like a coordinate on the fiber and G is a coordinate on the base. So this is the natural um, conjugate pair um, describing, or in, in the Hamiltonian formalism for this group element H. So if you perform, you compute these conjugate momentum, you immediately find that they satisfy certain constraints. So for example, the action doesn't depend on the time derivative of AT. So the conjugate momentum is, has to be zero. And you get these other constraints just from computing the, post, the conjugate momenta of these variables. And then you notice that some of them are second class, meaning that um, their Poisson bracket is invertible. 
So this means that we can str uh, fix them strongly to zero. We want to, to sort of gauge fix and eliminate all the constraints. We can do this by um, essentially introducing uh, or replacing the Poisson brackets by the Dirac brackets. So we can fix PZ and CZ strongly to zero by replacing the Poisson bracket by this modified bracket, which is the Dirac bracket. So I've written it here explicitly, uh, just if you've never seen it before. So these double angle brackets are just given by the pairing on the, the tensor factor i. So here, for example, there's subscript two. So I'm pairing the, the two space here with the two space there. And, um, and then I integrate over CP1. So all these fields depend on, on, uh, on Z and Z bar. They don't depend on time because I'm dealing with the Hamiltonian formalism, so I'm at equal time. Uh, I'm looking at an equal time slice. And what this here is, is the inverse of this uh, Poisson bracket. So this, the point is that this is invertible because it's just the kernel of the identity operator relative to this pairing. And so what's written here is really its inverse, which is just the standard formula for the Dirac bracket, which will f allow us to fix these constraints strongly to zero. So it turns out actually that uh, this Poisson bracket, um, or the Dirac bracket, is the same as the Poisson bracket for all the other fields. So once you fix BZ and PZ, all the remaining fields have just the same Dirac bracket as Poisson bracket. So uh, I'll just continue to denote the Dirac bracket without the star. But uh, to fix the other constraints, um, it's a bit more involved. So CI, you can also fix completely to zero, um, meaning we're going to restrict to the subspace in the phase space where CI is strictly equal to zero. So this is more, more involved. I'm just going to outline what, what's going on. So uh, this constraint is partly first class and partly second class. Um, so the first class pass you can extract as, um, by projecting onto the centralizer of the um, element UI in the Lie algebra G. And um, by introducing, in fact, any gauge fixing condition for this first class part, you get a total set of second class constraints, which you can then fix strongly to zero by introducing some Dirac bracket. So it's, it's a lot more involved than the previous case. And what you find in the end is that the Dirac bracket on the, um, on the fields H, or rather on the combination H, uh, U hat, which is H uh, U H inverse, these are precisely given by this kostom Kirillov bracket. Okay, so after gauge fixing the constraint CI, you basically end up with uh, the um, koston Kirillov bracket for the fields U hat on the reduced phase space. Okay. So we have one constraint remaining, pi t. And so um, following the Dirac procedure, what we should do is, is check that it is preserved under time evolution. So the Hamiltonian, after fixing all the other constraints which I talked about, the Hamiltonian just reduces to this expression. So there's this mu hat, which is um, this combination here, which will be important in a second, paired with t. And then you have this plus uh, what looks like the Godin Hamiltonian, which is promising. So we want the constraint pi t to be preserved under time evolution. So in other words, we want its Poisson bracket with the Hamiltonian to be 0. So that imposes a new constraint, namely that this mu hat here should be 0. Okay, it's a secondary constraint. And um, as is often the case in this procedure, there's no tertiary constraints, so the, the, constra the, the algorithm stops here, and there are no more constraints generated from requiring that this is preserved in the time evolution. Okay. So, um, and in fact, the reason that there's no tertiary constraints is because this um, mu is actually second class, which means, that, oh, for, sorry, first class, meaning that the Poisson bracket with itself is proportional to, to the constraint mu hat again. So first class really means that it, it generates some gauge symmetry. And in fact, mu hat generates the gauge symmetry that um, we had before, um, which transforms the connection A as a connection and B by conjugation. So we can fix this gauge invariance as we understood in the Lagrangian framework by choosing this gauge fixing condition. And it turns out that indeed, mu hat and AZ bar together are second class. So their Poisson bracket is this expression, which you can, you can invert um, using this rational function here, which you recognize as the R matrix of the, of the Godin model. So in particular, the formula for the Dirac bracket for fixing these two constraints is simply the same formula as before, but now I use the inverse of the Poisson bracket of mu hat with AZ bar. And, uh, and th this double bracket is the same as before. Okay? So now you start to see this R matrix appearing in the Poisson bracket. And what's really nice is that if you now compute 
the Dirac bracket for the field BZ with itself. So remember, BZ should be the Lax matrix. And if you compute its Dirac bracket with itself, you find precisely the Lax algebra. Okay, and where I emphasize that this R matrix comes from this um, rational function here, which came from the formula for the Dirac bracket, which involves the inverses of these Poisson brackets. Okay, so we reproduce the, the Lax algebra. And because we've now fixed mu hat and az bar strongly to zero, what this tells us is that, um, so if we go back to the formula for the Hamiltonian, uh, remember the Hamiltonian is this, so because mu hat is now zero, we're just left with the second term. So that's precisely uh, the Godin Hamiltonian. So on the completely reduced phase space where everything's been fixed to, to zero, the Hamiltonian is, is this one. So that's what induces the dynamics on the reduced phase space, and it's the, the Godin Hamiltonian as expected. And also because mu hat is zero, if you look at this equation, it's telling you as before that bz is just a meromorphic function with poles at the zj's and residues given by these u, ui hats. Okay, so that's the same formula as, as before, just rederived from that. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, because, um, so I, I didn't really say here, but these u hats were the same as before. They're the sort of the points on the i joint orbits, yes. Yeah, but now it's it's not it's not three dBF because we've gauge fixed down to 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 basically um, we've we've eliminated the the CP one essentially. So we've reduced down to um, to the reduced phase space, which is actually parameterized by the B, these BZ, and so it's actually um, the product of co-joint orbits, right? Because the BZ is really just the same data as these U hats. Yeah. Yeah. So if, you, if, if, you're, if you're familiar with the Hitchin system, you'll recognize this as um, the moment map for the Hitchin system. If I identify the Higgs field with BZ and A with um, the AZ bar component of the gauge field A. And so what mu hat is, setting mu hat to zero is just setting the moment map to this particular value, which is what you typically do in the Hitchin system when you have um, um, defects at the ZIs, when you have, uh, so, uh, ramification points at the ZIs. But you can also, in, in, if you replace CP1 in this story by a Riemann surface, you can also fix this to zero and obtain the Hitchin system out of this construction. Okay. So one last thing is we, we know that from this bracket we get that the adjoint invariant polynomials of B commute with each other, but we can see this quite nicely from the analysis I just described. So if you pick just generic polynomials P and Q, uh, then because BZ commutes with itself, then the Poisson bracket of the polynomial P of BZ is commuting with the, uh, the polynomial Q of BZ, just because B commutes with itself. So this is the Poisson bracket. But if you have adjoint invariant polynomials, then um, because uh, P is adjoint invariant and mu generates the gauge transformation by which BZ transforms by conjugation, this tells you that the Poisson bracket of mu hat with the polynomial uh, P of BZ is zero. That's by adjoint invariant of the polynomial. So it's also true for Q, but what that means is that in this formula for the Dirac brackets, this term is zero and this term is zero, and that one is zero because of this fact. So you basically get for free that the Dirac bracket um, of these two um, polynomials is zero. So this is the involution property just derived um, within this Hamiltonian um, construction. Um, okay. So let me conclude. Um, so. In this talk, I explained to you how by introducing certain um, line defects in um, 3DBF theory, namely these particular line defects, you can reproduce um, the Godin model in the realization where the abstract generators are realized in terms of points on the co-joint orbit O of uj. But it would be interesting to understand if there are other types of defects you could add to 3DBF theory. Uh, to produce other realizations of the Godin model, and in particular, it would be nice to understand what is the sort of correspondence between choices of line defects in BF theory and uh, realizations of the Lie algebras G at each site in the Godin model. So this is really a, a similar question you can ask in 4D Trans-Simons theory about surface defects and realizations of the affine Godin model. Um, Another direction is there are lots of generalizations of the Godin model. In particular, you can increase the order of the singularities in the Lax matrix to have irregular singularities. So these would be reproduced um, by essentially 
what you could call thickened line defects, which are sort of line defects where you remember some transversal directions by some epsilon nilpotent parameter. So this has been worked out in 4D Chen Simon's case um, in these papers. It would be nice to understand the similar story in this um, finite dimensional case. What are the analog of the defects we introduce for higher order poles in the lax matrix? Uh, you can also have um, equivariant lax matrices under some group gamma, which could either be the, uh, the cyclic group or dihedral group. So the lax matrix will then be equivariant in this way. And so um, again, from based on our understanding of how it works in 4D Chen Simons, it should be that uh, to produce such good M models, you can start from 3 dbf theory, but on some orbifold um, CP1 quotiented by the action of the group G, a uh, gamma. And then there are lots of other generalizations, super Lie algebras, combinations of the above, and so on. Uh, of course, the most interesting direction is uh, for quantization. So the advantage of this uh, 3DBF theory and its relation to the Godin model is that we know a lot about the finite Godin model and its quantization, as opposed to affine Godin models for which we know little about the quantization. So this should be a very useful toy model for understanding how things work um, when you pass the quantization. So Many mathematicians have worked on the quantization of the Godin model, and they've understood that it's related to the representation theory of the affine Katsumuri algebra, where the affinization here has to do with the spectral parameter, nothing to do with field theory. So the rep representations of the affine algebra at critical level. Okay, so in particular, all the Godin, mo all the Godin model Hamiltonians you can obtain from um, certain um, uh, singular vectors in the representation of, in the vacuum Verma module of the um, affine Katsumuri algebra at critical level. So, in fact, classically, 3dBF theory can be obtained as a certain um, level zero limit of 3D Chern Simons. So, of course, if you take the naive level zero limit, you just get zero. If you want to retain some non trivial um, information, you can scale the field AZ as one over K times BZ, and then that produces BF theory. Um, so, uh, in the quantum case, when you pass to the quantum case, we expect that the level should be, um, uh, should be, go from the zero level to critical level. So we expect this from the Godin model point of view. And there's also some recent work by Gayoto Witten and Zhang on the, um, on where they speculate on the quantization of the Hitchin system. And they argue that uh, critical level Chern Simons 3 in 3D should be related to, to integrable systems, um, quantum integrable systems, namely, uh, the quantum Godin model, or more generally, the quantum Hitchin system. So the quantum version of the um, picture I've described uh, in this talk should be the following. Okay. And then finally, the original story of Costello from 2013 was about uh, producing lattice models, and it was uh, further uh, expanded on by Costello and Yamazaki. So in particular, the, among these integrable lattice models, you can produce Heisenberg spin chain, uh, of which we know a limit is the Godin model. So in this, talk, in this talk, I mentioned that the Godin model can be obtained from 3D Chern Simons theory, and in the quantum case at critical level. So it would be interesting to understand how this diagram commutes, where on this side, you basically take the classical limit of the spin chain of Heisenberg to get the Godin model. What's the analogous procedure to go from 4D Chern Simons here to 3D Chern Simons, which, which uh, describes the Godin model? So, and in, in particular, in both cases, you have line defects. It would be interesting to understand how these choices of line defects to produce Heisenberg relate to the choices of line defects we've introduced here to produce the Godin model. Thank you. Thank you, Benoit, for a nice talk. Uh, so the talk uh, ended even slightly earlier. We have time for questions, please. Uh, 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 Enrico, yeah. Uh, very nice talk. Uh, and I want to ask a very basic question. If you could uh, reproduce a construction imposing, for example, some periodicity, like, say substituting the sphere with the cylinder, going like to hyperbolic case, uh, quadratic, uh, uh, quad um, and, and, and also going to quadratic uh, um, Poisson brackets and uh, doing some kind of relativistic deformation of this story with uh, Poisson non abelian, uh, non -abelian symmetries rather than uh, the usual Lie algebra orbit. Uh, if so there is some uh, impediment, so or maybe you already know, and I what you uh, where do you want to introduce periodicity? And what, 
in respect to the z variable. Say z variables are not on a sphere, but on a cylinder. In, yeah, in a well, sense. This is probably related to the orbifold story. If you have these lax matrices which are invariant on the z, z to, uh, zt, some, the action of some cyclic group um, here, this. So you pick gamma to be the, the cyclic group, then you're orbifolding, so you have this periodicity in the z direction uh, along the around the origin. Is that what you're thinking about? Yes. So this would produce trigonometric models. In, in, in fact, you can also look at equivalence under the action of, of, the, um, of z, the, the integers, which would, in that case, I think, produce... Um, so Godard models with this uh, equivalence would produce trigonometric models, I think. So, um, but why did you mention quadratic brackets? I think quadratic brackets, as I mentioned in the first slide, you, you can't really get from 3DBF3, I, from my, my understanding. No, quadratic brackets in another direction. You say kind of relativistic uh, or Poisson Lee deformation of this uh, uh, yeah, procedure. So maybe, yeah, relativist def relativistic deformations of um, trigonometric models. So maybe, I mean, this is related to this slide here where um, if you pr probably take the cyclotomic Godin model, which is equivalent in some way, producing a trigonometric um, story, this probably has a deformation to quadratic brackets coming from 4D transcendence. So my, my point, the main punchline is that 4D transcendence can produce finite dimensional integrable systems with quadratic brackets. And if you want models with linear brackets, you should use 3D transcendence or 3DBF theory classically. Okay, so the deformations which go from linear brackets to quadratic brackets, in the gauge theory perspective, is going from 3D to 4D, John Simons. Yeah. Thank Can you. it be generalized to elliptic in case? Uh, elliptic would be where you, I, I think, take uh, CP1 to be the, rem, uh, the torus. Um, yeah. And it's quite possible. Yeah, yeah, you can do mm -hmm. this as well. So, in fact, in this story, you can do the same thing for any Riemann surface, and you get Hitchin systems. And Hitchin systems on tori are elliptic systems. So, uh, further? Uh, uh, thanks for the nice talk. Um, it seems transparent at the level of um, equations of motion that you land on this, uh, these good AM models. You, know, you get this uh, lax matrix. But at the level of the Poisson brackets, can you give some intuition for why this should happen? I mean, why, why should you land on the right Poisson brackets? Uh, well, so in this, the strategy is basically just fix all the constraints um, as you can, and then when you encounter a gauge invariance generated here by this constraint, you know what this gauge invariance generates in the Lagrangian framework, and you knew how to gauge fix it by imposing az bar equal to zero. So it's just following the same story, but in the Hamiltonian language. I'm saying it's completely parallel. So all these choices were guided by what happened so clearly in the Lagrangian framework. So in the Lagrangian framework, we, when you look at the equations of motion, it's immediate what to do, right? But in the Hamiltonian framework, it's a bit more involved, but it's, it's really the same story. If, you, if you're familiar with this kind of, um, you know, Hamiltonian with constraints, it's quite natural to do all this. And the choices which, which you have to make are, in, are sort of guided by the choices you had in the, in the Lagrangian framework. Also, um, we first worked out the, the case of the affine Godin model where things were harder and this was easier to, to work out. I mean, we, we knew what to do basically because we already worked out the 4D version. Does that answer your question? Yeah, okay, thanks very much. Uh, yeah, there exist various dualities for Godin models, for example, relating GLN on K sites and GLK on N sites or some quantum classical or spectral dualities. Uh, can you see or maybe derive them from the other side of the correspondence from Chern Simons? Yeah, so I mean, this is a very good question. I don't know. Um, it would first require quantizing because I don't know of many classical dualities between classical Godin models. Um, maybe bispectral yes. dualities you can see. But these re require very specific representations um, by rank one matrices. Uh, and so you'd need to realize these realizations in the, by choosing suitable defects in the, 4D in the 3D BF theory. So, yeah, you'd need to find suitable line defects to produce the realizations for that context, yeah. But, I mean, I think apart from bispectral duality, which can happen between two classical Godin models, I don't know of any other dualities at the classical level. So you'd have to first understand quantum Godin models from 3D Chern-Simons, yeah. 
Also, another small question. Uh, in principle, you could derive Gaudin by taking a limit of uh, the spin chain for which the correspondence was known. Yeah. But instead, you found it easier to derive it from scratch, right? Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, this is the last slide. And I, it would be nice to understand how to close this diagram to get sort of a limit on this side. You see, this is the h-bar limit where you retain only the information about the classical R matrix. What's the corresponding h-bar limit in this side? It's not obvious. Yeah. Sorry, you know. Hello? Uh, one one more question. When you talk about this 4D realization uh, uh, R2CP1, I'm just wondering if if you know uh, th there is probably also this realization in terms of the moment map for the yeah. for the Hitchin connection. Yeah, yeah. And I know that people are able to reduce this uh, problem to the ramification problem, yeah. the ramification cycles, which is equivalent to the developing quantization scheme. I don't know if you have thought uh, it can be this a universal prescription for constructing quantization schemes, at least for this class of models. So I don't know, but it sounds interesting because the, the moment map in the Hitchin system appears naturally in this story as the, um, so mu hat, fixing mu hat to zero, as I said, is really just the same thing as fixing the moment map of the Hitchin system to this level. Uh, in the Hitchin system, you would fix it to zero if you don't care about introducing um, ramification points. So on high genius Riemann surfaces, um, you can, you can fix this to zero, and you'd get interesting Hitchin systems out of it. But, um, so maybe you could talk about it after, it sounds interesting, but I don't know what. Mm -hmm. uh, hi, thanks for the nice talk. Maybe a naive question, but another way to generate many integrable systems is from Einstein's equations, and in 3D, if you had, for example, uh, Einstein vile spaces, which are sort of spaces with conformal metric and, and the connection, mm. do, do you have an expectation what kind of Hamiltonian systems arise from, from these equations? Uh, so I'm not too familiar with this construction, but I think I know what you're referring to. So I, I don't know how it would relate to, to the Godin model and to, uh, to these 3D BF theories. But, I mean, maybe we can, you can tell me afterwards. Okay, okay. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Okay. If there are no more questions, let's thank Benoit again. <laughs>